Um, and then I'm going to introduce Christian Aganze, who is one of the grad students in the Cool Star Lab, who you've met before. Uh, and Christian's going to lead us in uh, learning about machine learning and specifically random forests. So Christian, I'll let you take it away. And thank you, Adam. Um, I think we're going, I'm going to share some slides and then we're going to go to the notebook only like for the next uh, 15 minutes. So are you able to see my slides? Yep. They're very, okay. So hi everyone, welcome to this uh, workshop. And in this workshop, I'm going to be talking about machine learning, which is a very um, up and coming, not up and coming, but it's, it's a very dynamic field right now. Um, how many people have heard about machine learning before? You can do thumbs up. One, two, a lot of people have heard of machine learning. Yeah, so, so that's, I'm gonna just be, of course, I'm not gonna talk a lot about uh, all the types of machine learning first, because I'm not an expert. And second, it's just very exhausted. There's a lot of uh, development in that, in that field. So uh, some of you are going to do, be doing a project that involves some machine learning. So it'd be good to have some kind of uh, introduction to what machine learning is. Uh, uh, Shole Deep Learning book. And what, how they define machine learning is that uh, it's a set of uh, programs, just like in classical programming. So, but the difference is that in classical programming, uh, you have usually your Python program, you give it a bunch of rules. Uh, they say you, you want to determine if a number uh, is, uh, is odd or even. And then if you give it a bunch of numbers, which is the data, and you give it a bunch of rules, how to determine if a number is odd or even, it's gonna give you answers. So it's gonna give you, these numbers are odd, these numbers are even. Does that make sense? This is like typically what you do when you, you know, doing classical programming. Uh, machine learning is different. So in, for machine learning, you're, you're giving the data and the answers, and you want to know what the rules are. So using the same analogy of trying to determine if a number is odd or even, uh, I would feed my machine a bunch of odd and even numbers and I know which ones are odd and even. So I want to get something, the, uh, the answers here will be, I know which numbers are odd and even. And then the machine will tell me the rules to determine if a number is odd or even. So this is quite a simplification, but in general, like uh, uh, machine learning and what you do in astronomy or in physics, which is just model fitting is a, those are the same thing, just a, another type of models that you can fit to your data. So hopefully those two pictures uh, make sense. So it's, it's a model, just like regular models that you fit your data, but you could also, you can also look at it as a way of getting rules out of your data. Any questions on that? That's my definition of uh, machine learning. All right, so, Machine learning has some uh, impact in the real world. Uh, so this is just a slide taken from some of the lecture notes that are from a class that I was taking. And uh, some of the search and advertising companies such as Google and Microsoft use a lot of machine learning in their targeted searches that you get on your YouTube app. Uh, also Amazon, Netflix, Etsy, sales recommendation, they use a lot of machine learning to do uh, what we call recommended systems. Also social media, uh, so any other company that has a lot of data, uh, even government companies, they're going to uh, use some kind of machine learning to try to uh, basically pass through it. And this is uh, the, the field of data science. Um, so what I'm going to do for the, uh, for the next few slides is just introduce a bunch of uh, jargon words. Uh, if they, uh, that you're going to encounter in, in this field. So uh, I'm going to, uh, just go through go through a few jar of those jargon one, define them, and then we're going to jump into the, no the notebooks so that it makes more sense. If it doesn't make sense right now, that's fine. Um, we will we'll get to the notebooks and we start actually working in, with the data. So there's two types of machine learning. There's what we call supervised and unsupervised learning. So all the jargon words here are going to be in bold. 
So the first thing is machine learning involves what we call labeling the data. For instance, if you have images of chairs and tables, which is images are stored just as uh, some kind of matrix, um, you machine learning usually involves giving a label. It could be like a physical, like a, a string label, just like the word chair or the word, uh, the word um, table, or it could be a number. So you could label the chairs as zero and the, and the tables as, as one. You can even add couches and uh, label them as, as two. So this is usually uh, done in all of machine learning. And there's another thing that we do in machine learning is we usually split data into what we call the training set. So the training set is the data that we build the model on. Uh, and then once you build the model, you predict on this set called the predictor set. This is not different from what you would do if you're determining, uh, let's say, stellar classifications. You have a bunch of stars that you know uh, have been classified, so that would be a training set. For instance, some of you are going to be working with the Spex Prism library, and you can consider that to be a training set. A predictor set in that case would be uh, if someone gave you a new Excel sheet of, of, um, of brand dwarfs and asked you to classify them, that would be your predictor set. So that's, that's those uh, jargon words. Uh, the other jargon word is here, uh, supervised versus unsupervised learning. So supervised learning uh, is, uh, is the problem when you know the labels of the training set. So I'm gonna give you some example in the next slides, but uh, we can have images of chairs and we tell the machine, these images are of chairs. Uh, and then we give it new images and we ask the machine, can we find which images are of chairs, which images are, are of tables? Versus unsupervised learning, where we have just a bunch of images and we ask the machine to figure out which ones are chairs, uh, which ones are tables without actually telling the machine uh, before that. So in terms of like uh, nice cartoon pictures, this is what I would call supervised learning. So in this case, let's assume we have um, a bunch of cat pictures and dog pictures, and we've labeled the cat pictures as cat, the word cat, or we let's label them as zero or one. And you, I'm putting here a division just to tell you uh, in your mind that we have these labels. We are, these are two different data sets, and we're feeding them into this model that we call supervised learning. And once we give the model new images, it's going to tell us. So if this will be our training set, so this image is here. If we give it a new set of images, what we call our, our predictor set, it would give us the word dog or cat or the number zero one, which tells us that this is a dog, uh, this is a cat. This new image they give me is an image of a dog and, or it's an image of a cat. And the machine has learned, the, that's what we call, the machine has learned how to identify uh, cats from dogs. And then unsupervised learning will just be, there's no, there's no distinction. We just give the machine a bunch of images and then we ask the machine uh, to label it. And the machine will either label dog or cat, or you can add a third label. Uh, and then this is, this is the main difference. Um, so before I go to the next slide, are there any confusion on the two difference? And the difference between the two methods, supervised versus unsupervised learning. You can unmute yourself, that's fine, or type in a chat. So the people that have heard of machine learning, have you heard of supervised versus unsupervised learning? You can vote with your thumbs. Hi. Can you explain again why it's unsupervised? To me, it's just like a line and the result is also dog cat in both, in both cases. Right, that's right. Uh, so yeah, unsupervised learning, the both, in both sets, we have a bunch of images of cats and dogs. But in the supervised learning world, we actually tell the machine, we label it. You can think of it as you have physical images of cat and you write on that image. If you had like a physical photograph, you write it on, this is an image of a cat in the background, in the back. Usually when you have like a photograph, you write in the back, cat. 
And then if, uh, if you give it to a person, it's gonna read, ah, this is an image of a cat. Or in supervised learning, uh, it's just a bunch of images uh, with no labels. And then somehow the machine is going to figure out which images are different uh, based on some features that the machine will learn. Does that make more sense? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, if it doesn't make more sense, we will, uh, we won't do, unfortunately, we won't do it in a supervised learning method uh, just because of the interest of time. But this is up to, uh, you can also explore those. I would, uh, in the, some of the resources that uh, you probably see for your project. And then I'm gonna to jump to the next thing, which is uh, random forest, which is a method that we're going to be using uh, in this notebook. And uh, so this figure um, just illustrate what a random forest is. And um, so the random forest method, which is what we're going to be using, falls into the uh, supervised learning method, which is here meaning we have a bunch of images of cats and dog, which is what I have here in this box here that called data set. And then in the end, we wanna take, we wanna get out the word dog or cat. And this is what I call the final prediction. But between those two steps, there's a lot of steps that are taken. So in each one, uh, in those steps involve building what we call a decision tree. And what a decision tree is, is just a, um, a committee, right? So a committee that's placed, uh, sorry, the decision tree is not a committee. The random forest is a committee of decision trees. Um, a decision tree is just uh, 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 a model that splits the data into smaller partitions. Um, you can think of uh, a good example of a real life, uh, real world decision tree would be, um, uh, you can create your own like decision tree. Let's say you want to uh, give students grades uh, in your class. You um, you want to decide who has A, who has who has B, and who gets uh, who, who can uh, who can get like uh, their grade rounded up. Let's say your decision tree will be like if this student has ninety nine point nine percent, I'm going to round it to hundred percent. And then if this student has 98, 90, below 99.9%, uh, I'm not gonna round it to 100%. So that's a decision tree. So one decision would be round up or don't round up. And that means you're splitting your set of students into a, a set of uh, students that are gonna be, have their grades rounded up, which will be one side of this decision tree. And then a set of students that won't have their grades rounded up to 100%. It could just be like one student, but that's fine. So you, you, you encounter decision trees every day in your life. Um, and this is just what a random forest is, is a bunch of decision trees that are making uh, prediction in the data. And then in the end, you just average those predictions together and you get what we call a final prediction on the data. So you can, in this, in the, if you go along with this example, in that case, you have like 10 professors all deciding how to round up student grades and then in the end, they will decide on, uh, on the final method of running up students' grades. So that's what uh, a random forest is. And we're gonna be coming back to this method, um, but I want to pause here if you have any questions about this, uh, because this is, uh, conceptually it's, 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 it's easy, but uh, I think that just uh, having this figure here could be intimidating. So. I'm going to pause here and ask uh, for questions. Yeah, go ahead, Orko. Um, it says that there's a majority vote taken. What happens if there's a tie? Is there some sort of tiebreaker method? Right. Uh, if there's a tie, um, it's, it's, it's just one or the other, right? So it's... Uh, there's, uh, if, it's, if there's a... So in the sense that... If there's a tie, that means they're deciding the same uh, the same decision. So that would be the average of the tie would just be that that tie. So if you average one and one, you get one. So that should be fine. 
it's not about it's not about like uh, competing, right? It's mostly like this is a different decision. This is a different decision, and we're gonna have, uh, average them together. Does that make sense? So, so maybe like if if the the split is between one and two, it would give a one and a half in that case, and choose instead of choosing one or two. Like if you have a hundred trees, oh, fifty go for one and fifty go for two, is the answer yeah. one and a half, or is it just a flip of a coin randomly chooses between? No, no, they would be one and a half if you're doing averaging. So what? So I have to be careful. So some decision trees, some random forests are implemented as average, and some are implemented as uh, the majority vote. So the majority vote is not the same thing as as, as average, right? Because the majority vote you have so the the majority. So for the majority vote, I don't know how the tie is broken. And then for the, uh, for the averaging, we're just gonna be the average. So for scikit-learn, I think this is, uh, I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is the majority vote, but I can look again in the documentation or you can also look in the documentation in your spare time, which Rocco's, is what we're going to be using today. Rocco's already figured out how to break it. Oh, nice. <laughs> you have a, uh, is that in the chat? No, okay. I have a question. Yeah. The data set is any kind of data, strings, constants, numbers, mixed. It yeah. can be, imagines, it can be anything. Yeah, it can be anything, but usually uh, if you want to, uh, the data we're going to be working with are just going to be numbers. Um, so images are also numbers, can be stored as numbers, and text can also be stored as numbers. So most of the things we're going to be working with are going to be numbers. And I guess that the projects are going to work only with numbers. Yes, yeah. And I could accept like spectral type, which you can also turn into numbers. So in the notebook, we'll see how we turn spectral type into a number. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's what this model and we're going to be using. And then one last concept, oh, for some reason I went to the last slide. Let's still play again. So one last concept that I want to introduce, uh, so I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you, but this one is also important. It's what we call uh, cross-validation. It's another jargon word. So it's a way of evaluating uh, how well the model is doing. So in this case, we've already built um, we've already built a random forest, and I'm going to be calling it a model because it's a model. And they want to know how well would this random forest do if I gave it new data. And to evaluate that, we use this method called cross validation. So what that means is that we split the data. So if this is the data here is a bunch of uh, uh, green dots and uh, red dots. We split the data iteratively into what we call the test data and the training uh, and the training data. So we most of the, most usually we, we put the training data to be the, the larger set and the training the test data to be smaller set. So what the training data is going to help us is we're going to build the model on the training data and we're going to predict we're going to get our average error, which is what we're going to be using in this case in the notebook. We're going to get an average error on the test data. And then we're gonna shuffle the data again and pick a different set. So this is shuffling. So we're now moving, we're choosing a new set that's gonna be a test data. And then we're going to again, train on it on this training data and test on it uh, on the test data and get an, another error rate. So error, we're gonna get an error rate at each one of these iteration. And in the end, we're gonna average those error rates and that's gonna tell us how well this model will do. Because if the error rate really changes by each, if as we shuffle through the data, uh, then our model is, is not doing really well. But usually, uh, if you train a model really well, um, and if you have a good training set, uh, when, once you do this procedure, uh, your uh, what we call your, your cost validation metrics uh, become uh, stable. So this is what uh, uh, the K here stands for, like uh, how many folds. So here we're doing the first fold, second fold, third fold, so this will be the kth iteration. People usually stick to like three or five uh, cross validation. So this is usually used uh, in 
evaluating how well a model is doing. And we're going to be using this in the notebook. Um, all right, uh, so let me check at the time. This is 23, I think. Uh, at 30, we're gonna jump to the notebook, but before I go further, any questions on this procedure? Uh, there's something in the chat. Oh, Adam has to leave. Uh, it's okay. me, me, me again. Yeah. Can you say again, how does this work? So, this one, uh, this one. yeah, this cross validation. So remember we have our model, and our model is just a, a model, a thing that tells us if something is a cat or a dog or a chair or a table. So what we're going to do is we're going to split our data into a, a, a little set called test data and a big set called training data. And we're going to build our model in, on the training data and test it on the test data. And we get, we're going to get out what we call a narrow rate, so how, um, how well this model does. So it's, it could be, it could have an error of 10% or 100%. And we're going to then shuffle the data, which is represented by this set moving here. And then we're going to, again, do the same procedure and get a new error rate. So at iteration one, we're going to have an error rate, let's say 10%. Iteration two, we're going to get 20%. Uh, iteration three, we're going to get 30% error. It usually it doesn't increase that much. And then if you average all of them, that's going to tell you the true error rate on your data. Uh, and this is just so you, uh, so you can know that how well would this model do if I give it data it hasn't seen before. Uh, and this is, this is important in, uh, because you want, what you want you ultimately is you want to have a model. And if I give it new data, you want the model to do really well on that new data. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, a little bit. Can can I see this like a correlation? Um, um, there could be some correlation in the data and, um, that makes it that makes your model bias. Usually, it's that means you have a bad training set, so you have to like create a really good training set and then do this procedure again. Okay, so well, I, I hope to to get more familiar with this news. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's go, there's going to be an example in the notebook. Uh, yes, yeah. that's, that's going to do this exact. Thing. Okay, I'm I'm getting the idea. This is new for me. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other question on this? I can do another poll uh, for people that have seen machine learning before. If that's like if you haven't seen it. Have you heard of cross validation? You can raise your your thumbs up. Yes, we have one thumbs up. Okay. And this is how you use cross validation. To the person that uh, I forgot who raised it. Yeah. Yeah, Carlos. Okay. Yeah. So. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, that's fine. Let's now jump to the notebooks. Um, so I'm gonna stop share uh, and then go to the notebook and then runtime. Oh, I need to share my screen. Is, can it, everyone access the notebook? I posted the link in the. I posted the link in the uh, in the chat. If you can access the notebook, let me know. So we're going to go through this step by step. Um, we're probably not going to finish everything, but we we'll try to go through it so you can have some practical use of this in your research. So, if you if you get to the notebook, uh, I think you should be able to have it in your own Google Doc. Um, so that we're not editing the same file, is that true? Or if, uh, or you can make a copy if you just want to be safe. So if you went to this GitHub link, you're gonna. This is what you have. You're gonna have this uh, nice little um, page, and there's this button here that says "Open in Collab." And if you click that button, it's going to take you. Uh, it's going to take you to to this page here, to a notebook that looks like this. 
So I'm gonna give everyone like two minutes to do that. Uh, is everyone on the same page? Thumbs up, or you can speak as well. There's one person in the chat. Yes, Adriana. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, thank you. All right, so we have a few people. If you, uh, is anyone having trouble accessing the notebook? So the reason I'm asking is I want everyone, uh, it would be nice to have people go through the notebook uh, instead of me talking about it, because uh, that that's gonna be boring. So it's good for you to go through the notebook and see if you can break things or if you can change things as I speak, as I as we as we work through it. Um, Gong ZJ, uh, I'm, I can, sorry, I, I cannot translate. Can someone translate this for me in the chat? He said, we, we will open the notebook. Um, mm -hmm. we, we copy the link. Well, do, do, do not what, copy the link. What? Just uh, go to the GitHub, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, paste the link, right. Oh, you want the link in the in the in the chat? Let's do that. That's the link in the chat. So do not uh, copy the GitHub link. Just click on it and just go to this button here and then open and collab. Let's see. Christian, can yeah. we we run uh, just the first one code? All right, so let's run the first thing. This is just installing Astro Query, which I think some of you have um, played with uh, in querying the data, at least in some tutorials. So this is just going to install Astro Query uh, on your Google Colab. Let's just wait for that. It successfully installed the package. And we're going to be using this to query some data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, okay, so. So the first cell is just uh, import. So we're going to import uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey from uh, Astro Query, which is some of the data you're going to be working with. And then uh, some also plotting stuff. So let's run that cell. And then I have some matplotlib aesthetics. So this is nothing to do with machine learning. You can just run this so that your plots all look the same. Is when is everyone here at this point? So I run this and this, and then so far we're just just importing things and formatting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me anytime because mm. um, this is going to be something you're going to be using in research. So. For at least for the people that are doing this, this project. Yeah, there is an error in the second second code. It's not running. This one. No, has to query yeah. point S D S uh, that one that one. I did. You, are you sure you installed this and the, you got this message successfully yes. installed? Yes. Yes. The next one is, is um, displaying error. Phone error. He found an error. Oh, uh, Dino, are you able to help with this? Um. Oh, if, if you want, I can wait and we can try it later. Because it's, 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 it's displaying me an error. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what this is. I need to look at it. This should be, is this running in your Google Colab? Yeah. It's not running locally, right? On your computer. 
I, I clean on the blue, blue, blue. Um, let me, let me, oh, let me check, please. All right, so I think I'm going to go to the next thing. And then if you have any no, questions. I, I was in a, in a wrong place, in a wrong place. Thanks for to tell me. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so we still have the first few, yes. few things. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Okay, so everyone is here. Is that right? I can't see anyone's face. So it's I'm just like talking to myself. <laughs> so. Uh, if you if you can do thumbs up, that would be good. Okay, thank you, Rocco. Okay, so okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to query ten thousand stars and galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and we're going to do some quality flight control just to uh, just to make sure our data set is clean. And how we're going to do that is going going to use SQL. Uh, it's fine if you haven't heard of SQL before, but that's fine. So what ask query does, if you give it this string here, it's going to query a bunch of things in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So if you run that, it's going to put this query into this uh, SCS query object, and it's going to return a data, a, a, a ASPRI table, which you want to transform into a pandas table. And let's just look at the five, uh, at the five column. So uh, sorry, the five rows, the first five rows. So these are uh, just a bunch of magnitudes that are measured differently. Uh, so this one is just PSF mag, this is one from the fiber, and I'm not sure what the other magnitudes are. So these are all in the magnitude in the R band, but they all measure differently. Uh, and we want to see if we can use this magnitude to tell stars apart from, uh, from galaxies. Does everyone understand the question? So we have a bunch of uh, magnitude and we want to use them to uh, differentiate stars from uh, galaxies. So this is what we call classification, meaning we have a class of, of galaxy and a class of star, and we want to use this uh, data to tell which ones are galaxies and which ones are stars. So if we run, let's just plot like one of the magnitudes here. Let's just plot uh, the PSFR versus the model magnitude R. And this is, uh, this is I'm using the uh, Seaborn uh, plotting library. If you remember from my other uh, visualization uh, workshop, or my plot workshop where I showed that you can uh, use this Seaborn library to visualize things. So here I'm uh, plotting X, I'm the PSF X uh, magnitude on X and then the model magnitude on, on Y. And then I'm coloring things by stars versus galaxies. And then you can see the stars follow this line here. Maybe there's some few others and there's some, there's some uh, galaxies that falls off from this linear trend. So if I, if I was to give you this data, how would you separate stars from galaxies? Just without thinking about anything about machine learning, just uh, from, this, from this plot. If I ask you to select stars, how would you do it in this two dimensional space? Oh, there's something in the chat. Draw a line. Yeah, that's the exactly. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, I would just draw a line here or draw some kind of circle and just select these things as galaxies, as, these are stars. But however, this could be or uh, like a filter. And then someone says also logistic regression, uh, which is also the challenge problem in this notebook, uh, if you get to it. So there's many ways you can separate stars from galaxies. And you just, uh, one quick method that all astronomers love to use, just draw boundaries in, 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 my, in these spaces. The problem with that is that you might be uh, contaminated. So how, you know, you have to be very careful and draw the boundary really clearly so that you don't have any stars in the galaxies and the galaxies in the star boundary. 
So you have to be very careful there. And I think it's from this plot is it's kind of hard to do. Does everyone agree with that? That it's kind of hard to manually draw a boundary between you know stars and galaxies in this in this in this region. You can think of drawing it in like multi-dimensional you know regions, but that's that becomes hard. I, I can't think of how you can do that. Maybe you can do that in 3D plots. So the 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 point of this is that usually our method of classifying things are uh, usually uh, prone to a lot of what we call contamination. So you, if you want to separate stars from galaxies, you uh, you might have stars in your galaxy class and, and galaxies in your star class, and that's not optimal. However, we can use our model, which is random forest, and this model is just um. It's going to build a bunch of decision trees, and they are going to vote which star, is, which object is a star, and which object is a galaxy. And luckily for us, there's this library, and uh, called Scikit-Learn that has a bunch of people that are way smarter than I am that have coded all these things up, and we're just going to be using them. And then Carlos says, "Can we eliminate outliers to minimize the amount of false negative or positive, or that be too inefficient?" That's essentially what you would want to do, right? You want to uh, do some kind of outlier rejection and uh, try to minimize like which stars fall into. Uh, you can also maybe create multiple boundaries. I don't know, but that's you will have to be you know, careful and try to minimize uh, false negative and false positives. Yeah, that's that's definitely something that you will do in in, in research. That's something I do for my research. Okay, so now let's go to a nice model called the random forest. But before we do that, I'm going to create, uh, since, like I said, random forest here work with numbers. So I'm going to change uh, the spectral class because the spectral class, uh, sorry, the classes here are not a spectral class, just the classes, galaxies and star are strings. And strings, we like to work with numbers. so. I'm just going to create this called numerical class, which if it's a star, it's going to return one. If it's a galaxy, it's going to return zero. And otherwise, it's going to return one. And then I'm just going to apply that to my class uh, column. And if you remember the pandas uh, workshop, this is just using the apply function. So if you run that, um, and you can also just look at the table again, and now we have a new, a new column. And this column is going to have numerical class, which is zero for galaxy and one for stars. OK. So then we can also see how many things we have here. So we have 4,000 uh, galaxies and 5,000 stars roughly equal number of stars and galaxies in here. Okay, so now let's get to, our, to the nice part where we use a random forest model. So this is again in this uh, package called scikit-learn or sklearn. And we're going to split our data into what we call a training, validation, and test set. The reason I'm using this is uh, this method is, uh, this is a good practice. So I didn't talk a little bit about the validation set in, in my, uh, in my presentation, but the validation sets uh, usually is used to uh, train and evaluate the model. And then once you've converged on a good model, you test it on the on a test set. But in this case, I, I would just be ignoring the validation set. That's why here I'm putting the train size to 90%. So let's just walk through line by line. So this first line here is uh, importing this functionality called train test split. So it's just a function that splits your data into a training in the and the test set. And you can do this manually if you want. You can just like take the first side, the first 10 columns and make them not the first 10, maybe the first a few thousand column call in the training set and this next few thousand column call in the test set. You can do that manually. But this the good thing about this function is that it has this option called shuffle, which shuffles the data. And we want to do that because we don't want some kind of ordering to bias our classification. So that's what this function does. And then this seed here, random seed, is just um, a pseudo random number generator. So it generates a random number so that whenever, if you run this notebook again, you will get almost exactly the same result. 
So I'm going to be using random seed throughout the entire, the entire notebook. Uh, so what we're, so here, what I'm calling features uh, are the, the columns here. So we're going to be using all this magnitude, which I'm calling features to classify things. So, and then I'm going to uh, remove the class because we don't want the actual classification to be part of the answer. That, that means we're, we're giving uh, the answer to the machine. And then this is just going to be a matrix. So X zero is going to be the uh, training uh, data. And then this is going to be the, the label. So this is data and this is the labels, which tells me if it's a star or a galaxy. So if I just run this, it's going to split the data into uh, what we call it training set and it's, uh, and it's labeled. So all the, all the data is going to be called X in this notebook and all the labels are going to be called Y. And if you count how many of these I have, I have uh, 7,000 in my training set and uh, 1,500 in my test set. And you may wonder, why did I split it to be this 85% or 90%? This is just uh, a convention. You can choose it to be anything else. But usually, the more data you have in your training set, the better, because you get to build a model that has seen at least most of the data. So this is a lot of information, but so far, uh, any questions? Here, we haven't built any model yet. We just splitting the data into a training set and a, and a test set. Is this confusing or? It has to be confusing a little bit, at least for the people that are seeing it the first time. Yeah. So to get the zeros and one ones, we run the um, the code after the table. We have the the graph, and then yeah, no, yes, sorry, yes, sorry, could you... yes, yes, yeah. yes, because I am I am running. Uh, long as you explain, and it seems to be working okay, but there is no zero or ones um, after the, the after I cl click on the run running the code. So uh, I am don't know if I need something to to do it. The right you thing. didn't see the you didn't see the figure yes when you run this yes did you run the previous cell mm, yeah the code yeah i get the you table to, yes you get this table right yes yes and when you when you run this what do you get it's right it's okay yes AX, yeah, it is the same. You get it, do you get the figure or do you not get the figure? Yes, I get it. Okay. And right. then. And did, did you have a question about the figure? No, my question is after the figure, we mm -hmm. run the code and suppose we will have the zeros and one on the table, the num class. Right. Yeah. So now we're labeling galaxies as zero and stars as one. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, my question is, how do I get that zeros and one number one? Because. Um, oh, I added a new. Yeah. Uh, if you do code here, if you click on this code, you can add a new new cell and just type in this thing here, the table, and then you just visualize the first five columns. So this is something I added. That's why I have this collab. So you can you can also add your own cells and play with the data. So oh, right now, so. yeah, right now the entire thing runs. You can run the entire thing through and it will run, uh, but I like at least for you to get something out of it. Um, okay. Cause the entire thing is gonna run and I want you to like play with it and modify things and, and have questions and See if you're confused about something. Oh, because um, this seeing, seeing this for the first time, it's going to be it's going to take a while. But 
I think I'm also making this notebook so you can come back to it when you need it to, to look through this. Okay, I, I see. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Besides that um, question about the adding new cells, um, does this training uh, splitting and the data make sense to everyone? Is it confusing to anyone? I guess that's, that, that's the question. You can also type in the chat or you can give me thumbs up if everything is good. Like I said, the entire thing can run. You can like start run the entire thing, it will run, um, but it won't be useful if we, if we just run through the entire thing. Okay, I have some thumbs up, thank you. All right, so this is what this is doing. It's just splitting the data into what we call a training and our validation set and our training set. So now we get we come to the good part where we build this um, complicated tree model that I showed you before um, in, the, in the PowerPoint. So uh, to do that, we're just gonna import it from scikit-learn because someone has already built the model. So we're gonna call this class called random forest classifier and random forest regressor. We're going to be using the regressor later and I'll explain the difference between classifier and regressor. Um, but for now, let's just stick with the classifier. So what the classifier does, is just gives you uh, this discrete. So uh, the galaxy classes, it is, you know, one and zero, these are two discrete classes, right? So there's a class of galaxies, there's a class of stars there. When you don't have discrete classes, that's when you need to use like a regressor. Uh, for instance, a spectrotype is not discrete, right? You can have a spectrotype that's M5.6, right? That's, and you can have an M5.7, that's debatable, but you can have like M5.76, that, that's fine as well. And so that if you have a uh, continuous set of, 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 of labels, that's why you want to use a regressor. And if you just have like discrete sets of labels, in this case, uh, we have galaxies versus stars, you want to use the, uh, the classifier. Does that make sense to everyone? So if we run this cell, we almost one hour in and we're going to take a break after maybe in 10 minutes and then we, we, we come back for the second hour. Um, but let's just run this first part. So if you build a random forest classifier, so we're going to import it from scikit-learn and we're gonna import this uh, metric called the accuracy score. So the accuracy score just counts how many things are, are correctly classified. Meaning if I had a star in the galaxy, if I classify a star as a galaxy, that means I'm incorrectly classified. So that means my accuracy will go down. But if I classify all the stars as stars and all the galaxies as galaxies, my accuracy will be very high. So let's see how what's our accuracy. So that's what this accuracy score thing is gonna help us do. So this line here is just initiating this uh, of classifier model. Again, this is a Python object. Uh, I know if you, You've seen this in some of the Python workshops, and it takes in the parameters here as the number of trees. So in this, in in circular, it's called an estimator. So the number of basically committees. If you remember the not committees but professors. If you remember the analogy that I gave on the random forest, a random forest is like ten professors trying to decide if they're going to curve the grade up or not create uh, curve the grade of students up. So. Each one of these 50 thing is one professor. So it's, each professor will make a decision or each tree will make a decision and 50 professors will make decisions and together we average them. So this is just initiating that class and we're going to fit. This is how you use it. You just, this is how we fit to the training data. So this is fitting to the training set and we're gonna predict on the test set. All right, so we're going to predict the labels on a, on a test set. And then, and, then, um, and then in the end, we're going to compute this uh, average uh, accuracy, which is how accurate are we classifying, how correctly are we classifying uh, the test set. If you just run that cell, 
you'll find that we just with this random guess of 50, uh, you can change this to 45 if you want, but I just chose 50 for no reason at all. And just with 50 professors, we can classify uh, things with 90% accuracy, which is pretty good, um, which kind of shows you the power of these models. So this is just, this, all, that, all that stuff that I explained can only just be run in three lines of code. Of course, someone has written like a much longer version that, that runs like in that, that's coding, hard coding second layer. But this is how we use it. Any questions so far? I'm gonna pause here and uh, see if people have questions before I go to the rest of the notebook. Like I said, the, the rest, the entire notebook runs, but uh, it wouldn't be very useful if I just go through it very fast. Questions? If you're confused, that's okay. Well, I have a question again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if I if I see those lines, just that right right there, from this one. Yeah, from screen mm -hmm. dot ensemble, it means that we get the classy the random forest classifier. So, to me, it's that that. That line, the random forest classifier, it's the mm -hmm. order to start the, the training. Am I right? This line here, uh, you were almost right, but this, this line here is just uh, initiating the, if I just did this, there's no training. If I don't run, if I run everything up to here, we haven't done yeah. any training yet. We're just like uh, setting up the, uh, the object is just like uh, building, it's, we're not building the tree yet, we're just like setting up this infrastructure that's going to actually tr start training. So the training happens at this line here, are, yeah. that fit. So this is when I'm doing the training. Okay, so yes, I, I, I think, well, it's like uh, the, uh, the initial value to start, right? That yeah, number yeah. 15. So, the order to stay training is just train, X train and Y train, and that's it. Oh, the X train and Y train is what I call the data. So this is, if you print what X train and Y train are, this is, this is just a bunch of numbers. Right. Right, so this is X train. It, it's all, the, it's all the, the magnitude. And then Y train is zero one, which tells me if it's a, to star a galaxy. Okay. So this is the data that I'm passing in. So I have to pass in the data and the labels. So this, the fit here is what's doing the training. Mm. And then once I do the fit, the training, I can now do predictions. Okay. And then I'm gonna show like the example of like fitting a line and maybe that analogy is gonna be much clearer when you compare to how you fit a line to data. I have something in the chat. Uh, does that make sense? That's that my explanation about. Um, so the training yeah, is done I, here. I get. I get. I, I was. I was confused because the name was train. So I right. thought it was the order to start training in this. Yeah. It's yeah. Called, I specifically not. labeled training. Because it is the training set. It is that it is the set that we use to train. It is data, but it's the data that we use to train. So that's why I, yeah. I called it X train. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so I understand is, that. Okay. Yeah, Carlos asks, I don't quite remember a lot about random forest. Is there any possibility of overfitting? Uh, Sophie has to go. Uh, is there, sorry, is there quite a lot about? Is there any possibility? Let me restart the question. So this is a question that's in the chat that everyone can see. Uh, Carlos asked if, uh, if there's any possibility of overfitting due to incorrect selection of number of trees. Yes. Um, 
there is so what overfitting here means is that once uh, you 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 feed the data and when you do predictions, the predictions go horribly. And random forests are usually designed to minimize overfitting because you're averaging many decision trees together. So each each tree will of course overfit, and then you you will try to if you average those all those classification together, you you get a better uh, representative. Uh, so the averaging of decision trees minimizes uh, the risk of overfitting. But yeah. So once we in the later in the notebook, I will show how to optimize the number of trees such that you don't overfit. Does that answer your question, Carlos? Oh uh, yes, thanks. Yeah, in later in the tree up in the notebook, I have, uh, have some uh, optimization methods, and one of them is you know, cross validation and uh, doing like searches, random search or grid search, which I will show. So. Before we go to the next thing, I just want to show this that Random Forest has this thing called feature importance, which a lot of models, machine learning models, don't have. So what feature importance tells you is that this, this is what it says: this this uh, this feature in this in this in this case we're using magnitude. It will tell you that this magnitude is more important than this magnitude in splitting the data. So the first magnitude here in our in our set has is more important than the next one and so forth. So I can actually just label them and employ this feature important that comes out. So it turns out that this PSF magnitude R is, is a better uh, discriminator of stars versus galaxies compared to the rest. So the first thing that's more important is the, this PSF magnitude and then the fiber two magnitude and then this fiber magnitude and then the least important is this spectral magnitude. So with just this random forest, you can actually select out which um, uh, which features or which magnitudes are better than others in terms of selecting stars versus galaxies. Um, so was anyone surprised that we got a ninety-seven percent accuracy with this? Just fifty trees. Did anyone try any other number of trees and see how many you get? Let's try two, three, three trees. 95, pretty good. Let's try, I don't know if one trace will work. 94, all right, so this worked really good. Let's try 100, it's still 97, all right? So it doesn't improve much after that. So that kind of tells you, so you can start like gauging over how, how many trees you need uh, for this to work. Any questions? So we are here at feature importance. There's something in the chat. In any way, it's one to the confusion metrics. Yeah, so if you wanna, this, thank you for bringing up, uh, Carlos. If you wanna do confusion metrics in the cycle and tutorial, uh, you can use this to, uh, the confusion metrics, which I didn't show in this notebook is something you, you probably don't need much, but you can read about it on, uh, I will probably attach a Wikipedia link. All right, so, we are at eight or oh, um, five on the East Coast. Um, so I'm going to to pause here and then we're gonna take a break. And then maybe how many minutes do you wanna take a break for? 10, five, 20, 15. Then we can run through the second part. I think 10 is okay. Okay. Someone says five, Adrian says five, someone says 10. Let's you go with the largest. Let's go with 10 minutes. So let's go come back at uh, 5.12. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dino, would you mind like pausing the recording? I don't know how to do that. I was muted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're back to, you can record again. Okay, now it's recording. Or it should be. Thank you. Actually, we one minute. So let's wait for one more minute and then continue for people to. To come back.
if you're back, you can do a thumbs up. I guess if you're not back, I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, you can do a thumbs up if you're back so I can know that we have at least enough people. All right, looks like we have um, maybe half the people we have. Okay, all right. So let's continue. So, okay, so now we've plotted our feature importance, which tells us which magnitude is best at separating uh, stars from galaxies. Um, so the reason we, you can ask why in so many magnitude if this one is really good. Uh, so if you just plot this best magnitude at separating things, which is the PSFR, if you just put the histogram of that, so this is what I'm doing. I'm plotting the, um, the PSF magnitude for the, for the galaxies, and I'm plotting the PSF R magnitude for the, for the stars as just a histogram. This is uh, something you're probably gonna be using. And it, it turns out that they overlap. So you can, you can draw a line and say that at magnitude 18, this is going to be star, and at magnitude 20, this is gonna be galaxy because they overlap. Um, so even though this is the most important feature by itself, you can't separate things out. Is that clear to everyone why you need more than just one magnitude? Right, if you, right, if you just put this one magnitude for stars, and for galaxies, there's an overlap, right? There's no way you can just separate stars from galaxies. Even though this is the most important magnitude in separating stars and galaxies. If you combine it with other magnitude, then you can separate stars and galaxies at 99 and 97% accuracy. So this is one of the usefulness of using uh, this kind of machine learning method. It's just, it's not, uh, it's not just intuitive that you can't just say, I'm gonna draw a line here and this is gonna be the cut. Uh, this is more like in this high dimensional space, it turns out that you know this is the best way to separate this data. All right, so we can see how well this, uh, this prediction, this model classifier does on high redshift quasars. The reason I bring up high redshift quasars is that these things uh, can also look like stars in terms of just being almost like point sources. So stars are uh, circular on the sky versus uh, galaxies, which usually are extended objects. And high redshift galaxies tend to be very hard to, to detect. So what this next cell is going to do is going to query some high redshift quasars, so above redshift of uh, 1.5. Again, this is another just SQL query uh, through SDSS. And then we're going to define all the quasars as stars. We're just going to label them as one. So this is what numpy that one does. So just create a bunch of one, one, one that look like the, this array that we passed through it. So if we just try to classify quasars as stars, we get an accuracy of 98%. So what does this mean? It means that this model sees quasars just uh, as point sources as well, which is, pretty, which is pretty good. So what this, again, this numpy that one here is just a bunch of one, one, one that looks like, uh, that looks like the, you can also check that it's, it's one. You can just do this is equal one. I think that all, and this will be true. This is just, just equal to one. So we're defining quasars as stars and we are checking the accuracy in, 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 of our model in predicting those quasars as stars, which is pretty significant, 98%. All right, so this is all I'm going to talk about, do about classification. So if your project is about classification, uh, this is most of the part that you're going to need and you're going to need uh, uh, optimizing the parameters. So you might ask, why do we use, why are you using uh, 50 trees here? Are there any other parameters that we can change? And that's later in the notebook. 
well, I don't actually change uh, the parameters for this sake of this exercise, but if you go into documentation, uh, this secular uh, random forest has more parameters than, than just the number of trees. All right, so now let's go to regression. Uh, so we've done a classification in, like I mentioned, classification is when you have discrete classes. So in this case, we had just galaxies, stars, quasars. Those are discrete classes. So now we're going to do regression, which is when the classes are more uh, continuous. And a linear regression, you've probably seen this before, it's just filling a line. So the line will have the equation mx plus b, you can write that down. And you can even write the, uh, the, the how to solve for the best fit line, which uh, minimize some kind of error rate. So we're going to define the error rate as the average, uh, the absolute value deviation from the prediction. So in this case, y will be, if I predict uh, y, if the true label is y and I predict y hat, and then the error will just be the average of y minus y hat absolute value. Uh, so notice that I'm not using the, the accuracy metric at all because the accuracy, the way accuracy in second language is defined wouldn't make sense for a regression problem. So linear regression, you've seen that before. So we're going to use uh, this package called scikit-learn. But before, before we do that, and we're also going to be using SciPy. But before we do that, let's just download some new data. We're going to uh, just not throw away this data, but we're done with this. Uh, star galaxy classification problem, we're going to do something else, which is something that probably gonna look like your project. So determining the spectral type of something just from its colors. So to do that, we're going to need to download some data that I put on this Dropbox link here. So this is some data from Christopher Tyson, who classified a bunch of uh, uh, M dwarfs in, in Sloan. And we can just download that data. So this is what this, uh, cell is doing is uh, is using wget and it's downloading this file here and it's saving it as uh, in this in this in csv file so this csv file is not going to be on your computer or your google drive it's just going to live in this collab environment once you click collab the csv file is going to be deleted if you want to save if you want to save this uh, this file you can just go to this to this link here and just uh, download it yourself Any questions so far? So here I'm just like downloading some new data that I'm going to use. So far, so good. Thumbs up. Okay. All right. So we're just downloading some data. So let's just look at what that data looks like. So it's uh, again a bunch of. Uh, magnitudes from a CSS, but in this, in, this, in this table, we're only focusing on m doors. So it's only gonna be m doors and some m doors, um, but later I'm gonna just change it to m doors. So if you look at this table, it's gonna have object ID, which is just some unique ID in Sloan, and some magnitude, uh, PSF magnitude in U, these are different bands, so U, G, R, I, Z, and then some errors, the uncertainty on those magnitude. For the sake of this exercise, we're just gonna neglect the errors. Uh, the errors are just very small, except maybe magnitude U. So we're just going to focus on the that on this and just ignore the errors. And then there's this subclass, which is the spectral the spectral type. Does anyone know how this spectral type will probably be, will probably determine? Any guesses? You've been doing a lot of classification. So that's exactly how they were, they were determined by fitting uh, templates. Uh, all right, so we're going to see how well our machine learning models can do at predicting spectral type from these colors. So to do that, we're going again to do is this kind of numerical spectral type. So this numerical spectral type is gonna start at 10. So 10 will be M0, 11 will be M1, and then we're just gonna keep doing that. So this is, my little function that I use, I define here, and I'm just gonna apply that to my data in the next cell. Oops, the cell is already running. And then I'm gonna cut out uh, things that are not m door. So um, I 
Ooh, yeah, so I'm going to create everything that's Eldors. So Eldors start at 20. So this is just going to keep everything in Eldors. So we can look at the, just the top five rows and see what that's like. So let's do this. Okay, so this is going to add a num numerical type that I start at 10. Okay, so far so good. Feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Also, you can post in the chat. Um, and thanks for the people that have been super active. Yeah, go ahead. There was someone on the meet. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't quite understand the 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 use of the type to num function. Are we some are we somehow getting an encoding of the subclasses or what is the purpose of the function? I didn't quite understand that. Oh, this subclass, sorry, this has nothing to Python classes. It's just, what is the spectral type? I think uh, Chris just called this subclass. So this just, the spectral type of M3 is going to be 13. So this is just a, because we work with, uh, with, flow, with numbers instead of strings. So this is a string, right? And we, if you want to make a linear regression, if you want to fit y equal mx plus b, we want x, uh, we want y to be a number and not a string. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I understand. So I'm just changing that from numbers to from letters to numbers. So m3 will be 13, m1 will be 11, and so forth. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So now we're going to do uh, compute some colors. So in this cell, I'm just computing R minus I, I minus Z, uh, U minus Z. So colors are uh, good because they correlate with spectral type versus magnitude themselves don't actually correlate with spectral type, right? Does anyone know why? A magnitude of uh, magnitude of in G doesn't correlate with spectral type at all but the color uh, like R minus I would correlate with spec type. Does anyone have a good explanation? From your um, astronomy workshop. Does everyone understand the difference between the magnitude and the color? Anyone? And why one will correlate with spectral type versus? I know some of you knows. No, you can just type in the chat. This is um, this is going to be important because that's how we're going to build the model based on that assumption that you know the color we correlate with spectral type. Can someone give me like a, a thumbs up or is it required? Rocco, nice thumbs up. So Rocco, you know why um, a color would correlate with spectral type and magnitude wouldn't? Did you give the thumbs up? I'm I'm sorry. I had a background noise right when you were uh, saying that. Could you repeat your question one more time? Right. Uh, why would the color, so which is the difference in magnitude, uh, correlate with respect to type, but a magnitude does not? Oh, uh, color is related to the temperature peak, like where it peaks in the visible light spectrum, and then based on that temperature, that's one of the ways that we can classify the stars easier. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right, yeah. So that's why we're going to use uh, colors to, thank you, Roko. That's why I'm going to use uh, colors here. And I'm defining some combinations. Some of these are probably wrong. Hopefully I didn't make a mistake. Um, maybe there's an, an easier way to do this, but 
I just take one magnitude minus the other, and then I define a column that's that color. So let's just plot the first one versus peptide and see how that correlation is. Ooh, I didn't run this cell. My bad. Let's go back up. All right. Okay, so this, um, the R minus I color correlates, but you know, there's a huge scatter, as you can see yourself, but it correlates with the spectrotype. So this, remember this are numerical spectrotype. So this is the M0 and this is M8. And as Roku uh, beautifully explained, um, this color is really uh, a proxy for temperature, which is also what spectrotype is in general. So that's the, this one-to-one this -one relation. And since it's a linear relation, we can fit some kind of line or some kind of uh, polynomial. And uh, to do that, I'm gonna use uh, SciPy, which is another library. And I'm just gonna do linear regress and that just gives me the slope and the intercept. So it gives me this, uh, if I go back up, it gives me M and B. Uh, this is something you've probably seen before, just a linear regression. And then the slope here is two. Don't get confused because it looks like the slope is negative. Here I flip the axis, 18 is down, should be up, but this is usually how we plot spectrotypes. Spectrotype, um, uh, but you can also not invert this. So I inverted the axis, that's why it looks like there's an inverse relation. It's, it's actually, the slope is positive but I inverted axis. Okay. So this is the slope. So this is, there's like a two and then the intercept is, is 10. So if you wanna predict the numerical spectrotype, you just do slope times X plus intercept. And if you plot that on top of that plot that I was plotting, it's just this line right here. You can, whether, you can judge whether this is a good fit or not, and you can try to put like a higher order polynomial. And uh, I won't go into much details over that, but we can compute what we call an average error rate, which is what I define here. So how much the prediction matches the real values. So if I run that, um, I will get an error rate of 1.27 subtype. That means that, uh, the average difference between the prediction and the real spectrotype is 1.2. So an M0 could be an M1.2, which is, which is pretty good for a line, right? It's, you know, it's not five subtypes. All right, so this is just fitting a line. So let's try to see if we can do better with this random forest. Uh, so the random forest here, now we're gonna use regressor. Again, I'm using regressor because this is now a continuous set of, of values. Uh, although they are discrete, but spectrotype is, if it, there is really temperature, and then uh, it should be more continuous. So if I do that, I'm going to use, uh, again, go back to our syntax. We're gonna define an X and a Y, X being the data and Y being the labels. And I'm gonna split it into training, validation, and test set. Notice that I haven't used validation set at all, but this is just good practice so that you remember to do this. Uh, and then if I do now run for its regressor, notice that this is no longer classifier and with the same number of estimators. So here we have 15 commit, 50 commit, 50 trees or 50 professors voting. We can get an average error rate of 1.13, which is not a huge improvement, right? from 1.2. So we want the error rate to go down. We want a very small error rate. Uh, the best, a perfect classifier will have zero error. Um, so that means it will be perfect. Each thing will be classified correctly. But you can see that the scatter here is, is huge. So that's, that's probably not gonna be the case. So this is slightly better than the line fit, but it's not that great. We can also visualize the predictions on on just on this axis. So I'm just gonna plot uh, the X, this flatten is just making a one dimensional array. And I'm just gonna overplot the predictions. 
Ah, okay. So the predictions are triangles and the real values are uh, the blue. So notice that there's, there should be, there shouldn't be a difference in the X position of these things. So th that's why they are on the same. They should only be shifted in the Y direction because we're predicting Y given X. So you can see that uh, almost, uh, you kind of reproduce the intrinsic scatter in the data and it, it does pretty, a pretty good job to me. Anyone, any questions on this? Is it surprising to anyone? Or oh, there's something in the chat, let's see. Was the question about apparent magnitude and color? Yeah, sorry, yeah, that previous question was, uh, yeah, thank you, I didn't check the chat. There was some, yeah, color is related to temperature, yeah. And uh, that has to correlate with, yeah, we expect that. I just checked the chat now. Thank you for, for all those answers. So you can see that the random forest regressor, right? Does a pretty okay job right, at predicting, even if we have this large scatter in the data, it still does pretty well. And this is just our default 50 trees. And then you can ask yourself, um, here I have a challenge, change the number of trees and see what happens. Um, but the more important question is what that we can do with a linear regressor, right? Linear regressor here, we're only fitting one line to each thing. You can fit multiple lines, of course, to each one of these colors. But for random forest, uh, I'm scrolling too much. So, sorry. This is where we are. For random forest, we can actually use all these colors at the same time without like fitting each one separately, which you can really do with a linear regression. So if we do that, uh, again, we, we define our new training set to be just all the colors, all of them. And then we still using our random seed so that we can reproduce the, uh, this thing and we're shuffling through the data again. And then if we predict, we get an, an average accuracy, sorry, not accuracy, but error rate of 1.14, which is not, again, it's not optimal. You know, it's not usually for this kind of things you wanna go below one subtype, but um, this is pretty good. And this is using all of them. And notice how fast this thing runs. It's very fast. Uh, so now we have all the color combinations and we, um, we have an average error of 1.14 subtypes, which is not a huge improvement on, um, what was the other? 1.2 linear regression, 1.27. But it's, it's, it's lower, but not that much lower. This could just be the nature of the data, which is the case for real world data is, is usually messy. There's something in the chat. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. All right, so if we plot these predictions against each other and against the real data, this is what they look like. You wouldn't notice a huge difference with this one subtype, uh, sorry, one color. Um, again, this all should only be shifted up. But for instance, let's see, let's pick this, this data point here. The predictions were a little bit above it. And here it's way above it. Um, it's, not, it's not great. This one is below. This one is way above. This one is uh, close. I think the predictions for this one is uh, somewhere maybe outside the, the limits. Um, you can see that it does a pretty okay job at predicting classifications. Um, and then you can ask yourself, is, really, is this really an improvement? Is this worth doing? Uh, depends on the nature of your data. If the data is really good, you actually get much better improvement over linear question. All right, so this is how a regressor and a classifier would work. And then for the last part of this, I wanna go over uh, cross-validation, which is how we evaluate how a model will do on new data. And uh, for that, we're just gonna run this through the, the last uh, few cells. So the, good, good, again, all these tools have been, plotted, have, have been um, coded in scikit-learn, so I can just use them from scikit-learn. So I'm just gonna import cross-validation. This is called K for cross-validation class in scikit-learn. 
and I'm going to create my own cross validation routine. So what this does is that you build a random forest regression model, and then you shuffle through the data. So this is just splitting the data, and then it's fitting on each little training set and predict on, 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 on a small test set and computing the average error. And then appending this to the error uh, list. So this is a list. If you do list that append, it's adding this um, mean error to this. And then in the end, after you've done all the iteration, you can change uh, how many iteration you want. You will report the final, um, the final classification. So this is just how, again, this is how careful correlation works. So you take the data, you split into smaller data sets, and then you fit and then predict, fit, predict. Uh, and you can do this multiple times. Usually people do five, uh, three, or even one time. So this, my, this little function is going to do that. So let me just run that, this cell. It runs in, uh, Fifth, this is just uh, you run in 1.7 iteration per second. It's very fast. And to compute the average error to be one subtype after five iterations. Uh, it's not a huge improvement over 1.14, but this is, uh, I guess, the best we can do with 50 estimators. You can imagine now that uh, you can actually change you can run through a bunch of models. You can run, you can uh, set a list. Uh, let's actually do that or not, because uh, that's going to be the next thing. You can create a bunch of uh, models. Let's say we're going to create 10 random forest regressors and then go through this course of validation thing and compare which one has the lowest error. And that would be our best model. So this is done implemented in this thing called randomized search. Uh, uh, randomized search CV, randomized search cross validation. So what randomized search does is that it creates a bunch of models on a grid, and then it goes through this cross validation process and computes uh, the error. So in this case, uh, we will have to actually manually uh, define the error. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm defining the error rate to be up, um, uh, real values minus prediction, absolute value, and then you just take the mean. And then we have to just format in, in this uh, make score function to be digestible by a second learn. Uh, so this is just some kind of uh, wrapper around that, uh, around our function so you can get uh, read through second learn. So the, meet, the real meat here is when you, this function here, which is gonna just create a bunch of uh, models and then go through this course validation routine and then return the best model. So to do that, I'm going to, this is how you set it up. So you create a parameter distribution, which is usually a dictionary. And remember that I said there are more parameters than just the number of trees. Uh, you can look up actually how many, what, what's the number, what, what parameter goes into the random forest and what they mean by just doing this, uh, let's see. See how we can do that. My notebook is lagging a little bit. Random forest regressor. If you just take to check the documentation, you just take that function or the class and you do question mark after it. And that will bring you this nice little page here that tells you all the input and output. So there are many other inputs uh, that I don't have time to talk about that you can change. Uh, and you can run through all those parameters. You can just put them into this dictionary here. So here I'm gonna run over, uh, the number of simulators is gonna vary from 20 to 100. I know this is like linearly spacing, but actually random search does its own spacing. Uh, that's just a detail in the implementation. So what we're going to do is going to pass in a random forest regressor and we're going to give it the parameter distribution. And what this is doing is just parallelizing this because the random search can be done in parallel. So you take one model, you do this cross validation routine here that I mentioned, and then you take another model, you can do those at the same time. So this is just for parallelization. Unfortunately here, we only have, uh, yeah, I think you can only have two uh, nodes, but 
if you have like a computer that has so many nodes, you can parallelize all these things and do it very fast. And verbose here is just so we can actually print something. And then random state is to, um, again, to make this reproducible. And then we're passing our scoring. So this is how we determine which model is the best. So the, the best model would, would be the model with the smallest, sorry. I don't know why this came up. The best model would be the model with the smallest error rate. Uh, so let's just, let's just run this. Uh, this is just the function. Let's just run our random search algorithm. But if I run it, is everyone uh, on, on the same page? Uh, does it make sense what I'm trying to do with the random search? Or are you confused? It's okay to be confused. But once you run through this like multiple times, it, uh, it's gonna be easier to understand. But right now, if you have any confusion, uh, since we have like a few more minutes, like 15 more minutes, but we're almost at the end of the notebook, we're not gonna go through the challenge problem. Uh, you can ask me. So what this is doing right, is building a bunch of models and doing this cross-validation routine and seeing which model is the best. So let's just run that. So we're gonna do, we're gonna perform a random search, which I defined here. And we're gonna pass in again our training our data through it. And we're gonna compute the best error on our best model. So the best model is what this uh, random search uh, routine does. So let's just run that. So this is fitting that cross validation routine and it's using that in parallel with two, uh, two nodes. And this is done just like that. Obviously with more parameters and if we increase this to be like a thousand estimators, let's do 500 and see how long this will take. Uh, if you increase like the distribution of things you can search over, it would take a little bit longer. So let's do that. So you can see that now this one is uh, kind of taking a little bit longer. And you can imagine if you increase the number of parameters and it will take even longer. Um, so what it's doing is creating a model, evaluating it and storing the error. Creating a new model, evaluate, store the error and then comparing the models in the end and returning the best fit model. Not the best fit, but the best model. So our best model has 30, 73 estimators. You would think that the model with like 500 trees will do better than the model that has 73 trees, but that's not the case, right? So our best model here has only 773. And the best we can do, unfortunately, is 1.14 uh, in the error rate. So if we build that model and make predictions, uh, we can actually see how well it does. And then in this case, I'm just gonna plot every single other color combination. So I'm gonna plot all the, all the predictions now instead of just plotting one, uh, one color. All right, so this is, let's just go through it. So this is plotting R minus I, I minus Z, and the blue again is the real data. And then the triangles are the predictions. You can see that it kind of reproduces the scatter and then the, uh, the predictions are not, are not too off. Although I think they're systematically shifted up. Is that right? Dino, do you see that? They all like shift, systematically shifted a little bit up. It's pretty tight. But, um, but yeah, so we can make predictions. This is just like any other model. It's like fitting a line or um, whatever other complicated model that you're going to be using to do classification. This can be done by uh, machine learning. So this is how we, we train a machine to make predictions, which is pretty cool. So we can plot the feature importance of this thing. So which color is more important in determining its spectral type. And we find that the most important color is G minus Z. And I minus Z is okay, R minus I is also okay, but U minus Z is terrible. So if you go back to U, if you go here to the plots and see U minus Z, that makes sense, right? This is, there's a lot of scatter here. It's almost vertical. Um, so that's why it's less important in, in uh, predicting the spectral type. Versus if you look at uh, G minus Z, let's look at G minus Z. 
this is g minus z. It's almost you know, linear, but it's not that great either. But it's not the scatter here is uh, less important. All right. So this is I think the end. And then I have a challenge problem where you can uh, actually use sort of doing. Um, line fit like we're using here we're using uh, mx plus b you can fit the spectral type with log logistic regression which is just this function here and uh, i define this sigma below and you can try to think of way to implement this and think of how this actually for people that are going to do neural networks for your project this is what um this is what it's based off it's basically some kind of uh it's more complicated than logistic regression, but if you understand logistic regression, I think maybe you'll be better understanding how neural networks function. Okay, so hopefully I didn't run through that very fast. I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna take a lot of uh, all the questions that you have. So this is again random forest is just one. Uh, supervised learning method. There are so many other methods. Uh, are you will see in the resources that we posted for your project that you will find like books and, and books on this. Uh, so this is very well known knowledge. It's out there. Uh, you can just Google and go after resources and find more information about this. Um, any questions? Is Carlos still around? Did I answer your question about uh, oh, oh, did Carlos leave? about overfitting? I think there was a question about overfitting early in the chat. I think did Carlos leave? I think so. Oh, there's something in the chat. All right, sorry, wrong slide. Okay, so there's there's okay, there is three things. It's pretty clear. Okay, because okay, and then Adriana, the logistic regression, it is a task. Yes, this is something for you to do. Um I mean I'm not gonna follow up on it, but if you if you if you find a solution that fits uh, if you find a way to fit this uh, logistic regression, um or if you, if you get confused about it, you can uh, ask me in the Slack and maybe I can give you some pointers. Uh, this is something to do on your own time if you're interested. And if you want to compare it to how linear regression and everything else will do. It's just another model, uh, just like a, a line is just a model. Logistic regression is used a lot in, because uh, uh, it looks like uh, uh, the nature of this exponential it just, it, just it picks really nicely. So it's usually used, defined as the probability of something being uh, of a specific class. Um, and there's some really nice algorithm that converge that minimize the error rate given that the, you're fitting for logistic regression. So, but that's beyond the scope of uh, this notebook, just something for you to think about. So the key takeaway, I think, from this is this plot here, is that the blue stuff is real. Is this is the data? This is something that that's downloaded off a telescope, and uh, we'll do some you know analysis on it, and then we plot it against we're plotting spectral type versus uh, color. These are proxies for temperature and other things that go into the atmosphere of a star, and we can actually teach a machine how to predict these things, these trends, uh, with just these few steps. Um, uh, maybe we can also stop recording. Um, 
ですね。